Okay, thank you. So, good morning, everybody, and for me also it's a great day, and I thank uh, Vinko and uh, Cosimo for the uh, organization of this of this course. Uh, Telegram has shown you the bowels of ordination, the mathematics of uh, the, uh, the basic mathematics of, uh, of PCA or ordination. I shall present you some examples of how you work with them concretely, those methods. And I may first reassure you, to run a PCA, you won't have to write yourself the, the equations that Pierre showed you. Of course, they are the uh, functions in R that do that for you automatically. But of course, it's very important to go through these mathematics in order for you to know what you're doing. Because too many people use statistical software in a quite automatic way. And actually, they, they don't know what they are doing. And this is the place where you can make mistakes because you could misuse those methods. You can go, uh, you can use one instead of another because you simply don't know the limits and the applications. And this is a point uh, where I shall, uh, of course, uh, stress some, uh, some particular aspect. I'll briefly come back to some aspects of PCA later. But then, uh, first, I'll go through that uh, uh, short part concerning transformation of uh, species abundance data. Or, uh, actually, I'll go even more in, in, the, in the basics of uh, general types of transformation. But th this is, will be very short. Uh, you, you have sometimes to transform data for different purposes. One of them being, for instance, to make comparable descriptors that have been measured in different units. Uh, ranging is one, uh, although not so well known or maybe not so often used. Uh, ranging uh, consisting actually it in, uh, in uh, expressing the variables in such a way that uh, the maximum would be always one equal to one, or you can do, uh, you can go further and uh, transform the data so that they express, are simply re expressed, rescaled uh, between zero and one. And this is the, the complete way of ranging data. This is used, for instance, in a particular uh, case of model two uh, regression called range major axis. Uh, but of course, we will not go into this one uh, for now. But as Pierre told you, one of the mostly used transformation is standardization, meaning you subtract a mean and you divide by uh, standard deviation. Uh, and you obtain those uh, so-called z-scores, z-scores, uh, that are used, for instance, in PCA when you have, uh, as uh, Pierre Lejean told you, uh, when you have different, uh, when the variables are expressed in different physical units, you would do that. Or, uh, as we will sh see in a couple of days, in RDA, the explanatory variables are automatically standardized by the software. Because generally, in the most general case, those explanatory variables are expressed in various and different uh, physical units. Uh, for the other ones, uh, you certainly know about square root transformation that you may use when the, your data are moderately asymmetric that way. Um, so with uh, possibly a constant if you have uh, negative values to avoid uh, complex numbers. Uh, so uh, this is a possibility. Uh, the other one being the log transformation. When the asymmetry is a bit more extreme, you may resort to log transformation. And there, the constant may be used if you have either negative or zero values, because of, uh, the log of zero is undefined. So uh, a typical case of that, if you have to log transform species abundance data to scale down the largest abundances, we, we do that quite often, then you would transform uh, by setting the constant to 1. Because in that case, if you have zero abundance, you have the log of one, which is zero. OK? You fall back to zero for zero abundances, and the rest is uh, transformed, and uh, the addition of one being uh, uh, almost negligible to, to them. And this has generally the effect of uh, making the da data more or less symmetrical. You have always the problems of zeros here, and I'll come back to that problem. Uh, later on. Uh, in other situations, you may have data that are in semi-quantitative ways. 
uh, expressed in, in semi-quantitative uh, scales, like, for instance, in Europe, it's well known, the brown Blanquet uh, scale for uh, phytosociology, uh, or simply ordinal scale. Uh, of, uh, here you have uh, uh, the, the, the scale, uh, the, the brown Blanquet scale, for instance, and uh, you have a re-expression in an uh, in, uh, ordinal scale of, of 10 units, uh, 0 to 9 here. But in any situation where you have those uh, semi-half quantitative uh, ways of expressing uh, variables, you may be interested in recoding them in a quantitative way. This does not restore more information. It's just a way of re-expressing your variables in uh, ways that suits more. For instance, you could simply, in the, in the simplest way, if you take the, 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 you use the scale, you can uh, uh, put this to an exponent w. If w equals 0, you express, you re-express this as a 0, 1 presence absence scale. And at the other extreme, you will uh, give higher weight to uh, larger abundances on the scale. I used such uh, things when I was studying oribatid mites, as Pierre Jean told you, I was uh, uh, studying those animals uh, several years ago. And uh, uh, that the type of animals you can find uh, three or 400,000 uh, individuals per square meter. So even in, in small cores, you have quite a lot of them, and it's time effective and cost effective to estimate the abundances. And I have devised a, a, an ordinal scale from, one, from zero to five uh, that visually corresponded uh, to something that was quite akin to a logarithmic uh, transformation, actually. So uh, after that, if I needed to, uh, uh, to upscale uh, the abundances, I could use uh, such uh, transformations. Another case that we will address later because we'll use uh, those types of descriptors is with qualitative uh, descriptors, where we have several classes, uh, like the, 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 uh, the levels of a factor in ANOVA, for instance. Here, for instance, uh, I borrowed this from uh, material from uh, François Gillet, uh, where you have four types of soil, which are four classes, but those classes are not quantitative in any, any case. And uh, in several situations, you may have to recode them into uh, binary descriptors called dummy variables. And you would think that for four classes, you would use four binary descriptors. But if you look at it closer, you see that three are enough because everything is fully uh, characterized the first, the first one by a one here and two zeros, and then the one is here, the one is here, and the fourth case when you have no one at all. So you don't need the fourth one. And this is coherent, we, uh, consistent with the fact that actually a factor with four classes, four categories, has three degrees of freedom. So uh, by recoding such a qualitative variable into dummy variables, you obtain as many variables as you have degrees of freedom in the factor. Uh, we'll come back to this, and we'll show you another uh, kind of orthogonal coding called uh, Helm Helmer contrast uh, later in this course. Okay, that was a short overview of what we uh, have for the general types of transformation. But the main purpose of this first part of, uh, uh, of my, uh, my course today concerned transformations to obtain ecologically meaningful relationships uh, among sites while using linear techniques. What is hidden uh, beneath, uh, behind this concept? Uh, to understand, I'll now present something that is specific to species data. And this is also a good example of the reason why many of the multivariate techniques, methods, that have de been developed for ecology have been developed for, by ecologists. Because in every field, and you may have different fields, in every field you have special uh, situation cases that may require, require specific treatment. So for people who 
would be interested in developing or transposing such kind of methods in their field, and if their field is not uh, concerning species data, you may have to think about this and look at some specificities. So in this case, the problem is called the double zero problem. In community composition data, where you often sample over large ecological gradients, uh, the data set resulting is full of zeros. Because in many places, you have uh, species groups that are specific to one situation and other species to other situations, and uh, those don't not necessarily overlap with the others, so they are absent for a part of the, of the sites, and they are present in other parts of the site. So um, this proportion of zeros is all the greater when, when, you, when you sample over larger, uh, broader ecological uh, well, transects or any kind of, uh, of gradients. So it, it, uh, it may end up with something like this, and even there, uh, you know, there are not so many zeros in this uh, short uh, sub uh, part of the oribatid mite data that uh, Pierre has already presented you, but all the situations where you have here two zeros for the same species. This species is absent from those two sites, three and four. And for instance, they may not necessarily be uh, just one after the other. Site five and 10, uh, this species is absent from those two sites. So this is what we call double zeros. Why is this a problem? The zero value in a matrix of species abundance is tricky to interpret. Because if you have a species that is present in two sites, it means that minimally these two sites offer ecological conditions that are suitable for that species. So the main uh, uh, dimensions of that species' ecological niche are uh, set in a way that is adequate for the, that species in both sites. So this can be interpreted as a resemblance between the two sites, because they have characteristics that are common, uh, ecological characteristics. On the other hand, if a species is absent for, from two sites, actually you cannot know if the reason of its absence is the same in the two sites. You may say, yes, I know my species very well. And uh, Well, if you work in restricted uh, uh, gradients or, or areas when you perfectly know that every species at the outset could potentially be present in every site, then this may not concern you. But in the most general cases, you have a large number of species over broad ecological gradients. And this means that you certainly cannot be certain that in every case of double zeros, and there are many, many, many of them, you can be certain that the two species are absent for the same reason. A species may be absent from one side because it's too dry, from another one because it is too acid, from a third one, because you have simply missed it, it was just, uh, the, well, uh, five centimeters away, you, have, uh, you, you may have encountered and captured it, so you, you cannot be sure. As a co consequence, you cannot interpret a double zero as a resemblance between two sides. And this has major consequences on the choice of the methods you will use to analyze species data. This is extremely important. Pierre Lejean uh, stressed the fact that everything, uh, all, all those analyses, or the, most of them, are based on comparison among sites, or among species, or, well, variables. So the choice of an appropriate distance dissimilarity measure is crucial because this will determine whether the rest of the analysis will be adequate, will be usable, or if you made a mistake 
from the beginning on, and act, uh, the rest of it may be meaningless. Uh, in the Green Book's language, the association coefficient, we'll speak in detail about uh, association coefficients later, tomorrow actually, uh, those association coefficients being the measures uh, between, uh, to, to, to measure the, the, the distance or the resemblance between sites. Uh, Pierre already mentioned the Euclidean distance, which is uh, actually the main one. Uh, this is but one example of the many. Uh, you may have heard of Bray Curtis distance, for instance, for uh, people working with uh, community data, which is another example. So the association coefficients that consider the double, double zero as a resemblance, as any other value, these are called to be symmetrical because a double zero or a double one, if you speak presence absence, have actually the same meaning. Actually, the double zero would be considered as a valid measure of resemblance between two sites, which would be true with uh, physical or chemical variables. If you, uh, if you have uh, zero milligram per um, uh, square uh, or cubic decimeter of, uh, uh, of uh, I don't know, uh, uh, nitrogen content in a soil and in another one. These are truly resemblances between the two sites. They tell you something about the ecological conditions of those two sites, and those resemble each other uh, uh, on, this, on this particular point. So th those symmetrical measures would be adequate for the, that, those situations. On the contrary, the association coefficients that do not consider the double zeros as a resemblance, those are said to be asymmetrical. Asymmetrical, meaning that double one has one meaning, double zero has another, or possibly no meaning at all, meaning they are not considered as uh, to measure the distance or the resemblance between two sides. And those are uh, the ones to be used when analyzing species data. And now I throw a stone in what Pierre's, in Pierre's example. Because from that point of view, PCA being based on the Euclidean distance is not adapted to raw species data. Because PCA, uh, Euclidean distance, when you have, you know, Euclidean distance, everybody knows Euclidean distance, if, even if you don't know the equation. Equi uh, in any space uh, the defined by uh, variables, uh, Euclidean distance is the physical or, well, the distance between two given points. I mean, uh, there is a Euclidean distance of about three meters between uh, me and you. And, uh, well, this is uh, Euclidean distance. Now, replace uh, X, Y, and Z, and Z uh, geographical uh, dimensions by dimensions measured by pH value and temperatures and, and well scaled uh, as, you, as you wish to do it, you still can define the same Euclidean distance between the points. But in a Euclidean world, world, when you have two points that had many zeros in common, many, meaning that in many dimensions the, the measure is the same, those points will end up very close to each other. So the double zero is uh, so two points that have many, double, many zeros in common uh, will be considered very resemblant in that sense. So why did Pierre use this in uh, species data in his very simple example? Because he used only three species. And you may have noticed that those three had no zero and certainly no double zero values. In them. It was a, a very small example of three species that may have been close to one another in a short part of the ecological gradient. And that may be a possibility to use PCA with raw species data. Now, until 2001, that was about the end of the story for PCA, meaning that for all practical purposes, PCA was not an option to study uh, species data. We resorted to correspondence analysis, which, will, uh, which I will present to you uh, in a moment, or ma 
maybe principal coordinate analysis, but not PCA. But then came Pierre, and his usual genius, and I wait my words, because I was there when he had that idea. And I still remember, you practically could see the electricity in the room. He just thought, yes, but he, 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 he thought that you have other measures of dissimilarity distances to study asymmetrical ones, to study species. But they were not in the world of PCA. But then he, he thought that actually a couple of them had a Euclidean component in them. And then mathematically, you could dissociate the Euclidean part from the rest. And so these distances could be re-expressed as a pre-transformation, a prior transformation of species data in such a way that when you submit this transformed data to a method based on Euclidean distances, and this includes, uh, this includes PCA, this includes, uh, well, uh, ANOVA, for instance, multiple regression, and so on, then when you take the transformed data, submit it to you, the Euclidean uh, based uh, technique, whatever the technique, then the actual distance or the similarities that has been preserved is the one that has been uh, decomposed, and no more the Euclidean distance. And that opened up uh, all the world of those linear measures, uh, well, techniques, methods, to uh, the uh, species abundance data. The five, and this ended up uh, with uh, an extremely important paper by uh, Pierre Legendre and his uh, colleague Jean Gallagher in 2001. Uh, the summary of it, they presented five such uh, distances. They were already known and used by ecologists, core distance and so on, uh, Hellinger distance at the end, which are actually the both that are most used. Uh, those can be obtained by using PCA or ANOVA uh, by pre-transforming the species in these ways. So these are not uh, measures of distance. These are the measures, these are the, the way you pre-transform your data before you submit them to the analysis. For instance, here in the first uh, row, core distance, you know, what, what does this mean? It, it means that in each row of your data matrix, you uh, square all the values, you sum these squares, you take the square root of what you have obtained, point by point, I mean species by species, and then all your species abundance you divide by this term. Of course, this will be done automatically in R as well. And to go to the, uh, the other one that we use very, very frequently, the Hellinger distance, it's even simpler. You take the, you divide all the species abundance in one row, in one site, by the sum of all abundances at the end of the row, here, y, uh, i plus, and you take the square root, and this is your new uh, abundance, transformed abundance value. So these two are uh, well, experience had shown that those are the two that gave uh, the, the, the most uh, interesting results. So uh, I mostly speak about these ones. Uh, maybe just uh, parentheses about uh, the uh, chi-square distance here, which is a transformation uh, which uses row and column information. And uh, this is the distance that is preserved in uh, correspondence analysis that we, I will speak about later. A little example. Uh, this is called, well, this is a small example of what uh, Orlot C in 78 called the species abundance uh, paradox. So it's an illustration of the problem, of the double zero problem. You have here three sites described by three species here with their abundances, and uh, you see you have a couple of zeros here. 
if you compute Euclidean distance, so ima you could imagine that those three species are represented by three axes, uh, x, y, and z, and you position uh, your sites uh, the way uh, Kerr has shown you in his uh, 3D uh, graph that he, he could uh, place in every, uh, every position he wanted. So uh, you have here uh, the data. If you compute now the distances among all pairs of uh, those uh, sites, you obtain this matrix, which is symmetrical because uh, here, of course, on the diagonal, you have distance from site 1 to site 1. So, of course, by definition, it's 0. And uh, these values are the same as the ones here above the diagonal. So what you observe here, that actually the distance between sites 2 and 3, sites 2 and 3 are those two, which have absolutely no species in common. Site 3 has only species 1, and site 2 has species 2 and 3, but not 1. You see that. Uh, this distance in, in uh, Euclidean terms is actually shorter than the distance between site 1 and 2, which has all species in common. This is an effect of the double zero problem, because those, double, uh, those uh, zeros uh, between uh, the sites uh, interfere and uh, you have, uh, well, you, you may have other situations where, where it's even worse because you have real, uh, here, here you have simple zeros actually between, uh, between side two and three, but you, you may have other situations where, where you have double zeros and, uh, and it's even worse. <coughs> they are actually very, very close. But the effect of the transformation, uh, those transformations I've shown you, most of them are here now, uh, is to correct the situation. Now you see that in every situation when you use uh, the pre-transformation and then you plug this into the Euclidean distance formula here. I mean, to go from this to this equation, you just replace uh, the original, the raw abundances by the transformed values, which are here. You know, uh, you see the correspondence here. Well, so uh, in, a, in every case, you have the, the, the appropriate situation where sites w which have species in, co in common are actually closer now when you respect the chord distance or the Hellinger distance or the chi-square distance. Uh, species profiles we don't use very uh, much now. It has been shown to have some problems. But, uh, so, well, the take-home message here is when you have species abundance data with the zeros and the most general case, uh, you can use, you still have the possibility of use linear methods like R, uh, PCA, RDA, and, uh, and uh, ANOVA, for instance, but you have to pre-transform your species. So the core transformation, which is one that gives good results according to our uh, experience now, uh, consists in transformation. The transformation I, I showed you, actually, uh, uh, each object has now a length one, and it's the distance between those objects uh, along a chord. If you have uh, 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 two sides here, uh, you have you you could uh, you could embed the whole thing in a, in a circle because now all objects have the same length, and the chord distance is actually this one. So uh, if you want to figure out what uh, what the chord distance means, it can be obtained in R by uh, one the function decostand, which is in Vegan, uh, one of the of the packages that we, we will heavily use in our uh, practicals. So you just uh, feed it, feed the, 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 your data matrix, your, your untransformed data matrix, species data matrix here, and you ask for normalize because it, this is what it does. It normalizes all vector lengths to one. So if you uh, use these uh, y dot chord here, uh, matrix that I have produced here, in any uh, of those methods, you actually preserve the chord distance among sites instead of the uh, raw Euclidean distance, and now you are appropriate for species data. Um, the Hellinger tra transformation can be obtained with uh, argument Hellinger, which you can uh, shorten to anything meaningful like hell, possibly with one uh, L, because if you, if you keep the two Ls, it will give you a nightmare uh, of uh, transformation. Well, in any case, this makes it useful for your uh, abundance data. So these are the 
transformation that can be and that we heavily suggest you to use whenever you deal with species abundance data. Um, at this point, <coughs> oh, there's a mistake here. The P is missing. Uh, <laughs> at this point, if anybody has a question related to what I already explained, no. Questions will come with the practicals, I'm quite sure. And while I'm at it, concerning the practicals, uh, well, I have written here the address where you'll find all the material. And the material is abundant, for sure. You will see that for each day, we present you a series of um, documents built by Pierre and oriented in such a way that you may explore the mathematical aspects of the, the methods. So we produce the examples that uh, Pierre showed you and go further into that and see how it works uh, in, the, in that kind. Because all those matrix, uh, matrix equations can be written down quite easily in R. Well, another of the maybe uh, understated, but in any case, uh, useful requirement for the, 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 the practicals is that you have a minimum working knowledge in R. Otherwise, the only possibility for you will be to spend next night studying the basics of R using one of the uh, uh, or two of the document documents that we you provide that, that are provided to you. Uh, so it's called introduction to R, and you you really learn what R is and how it works and so on. So it, it's absolutely I, I I must stress this. It's absolutely necessary that people have such a minimum working knowledge in R to be able to follow the practicals in, uh, in, in these, day, these next days, including today. Um, I'm certain that among you, many people have already a working knowledge in R. I would strongly encourage those persons to pair, possibly this afternoon, with people that don't have that knowledge in order to, to have some clusters of people that could help themselves and go uh, into the practical in such a way. And for each day, uh, I think it's the last row in each, each time, you have a, a, a document which is an R script, the practicals that I have built. These practicals have been built upon those that are presented for the yellow book. And this, uh, these practicals are actually well, borrowed but adapted from the material that is distributed on the, on the, the page of this book, and uh, Pierre presented you this, uh, this page earlier. Um, they have been updated to the latest uh, R version, and they, uh, they, they, they will be useful for, uh, well, they can be usable for, uh, hopefully, uh, on the computers here, of course, and uh, most probably, and I hope so, for the personal computers. For, uh, everybody here. So the scripts go through the day's methods, and you have titles saying, OK, uh, let's do a PCA on the uh, physical chemical variables so we don't have to transform, and so on. And we have uh, this, uh, this notion coming uh, sequential, sequentially. And in many cases, I have provided m maybe two different ways of presenting biplots uh, with using two different uh, functions that are uh, available in a in the, in, the, in the document. So you, you will have, what I suggest you to do is to download all the material into one uh, folder and in R define this folder as your working directory. So in this case, each time you will import a material, it will be easy because it will be from the same directory and you, you don't have to navigate through the whole uh, architecture of your, of your computer to go and fetch the, the documents. And so uh, normally everything should, should work fine for you. We, of course, hope so. <laughs>